Okay, so uh, welcome again, everyone, to Common LA. We're happy to see you here. Uh, today's speakers are Matthew Colebrook and Jose Garay. Matthew is a junior research fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge, focusing on spectral theory, solutions of PDEs, neural networks, and inverse problems. He's speaking today on diagonalizing infinite dimensional operators, computing spectral measures of self-adjoint operators. So Matthew, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you to the organizers. Can everyone see the, uh, the slides? Okay, uh, so, so I'm going to be talking about uh, diagonalizing infinite dimensional uh, operators. And by that, I mean uh, computing something called uh, a spectral measure. So I'm going to explain a bit about what that means. Uh, but this, before I launch into that, I should say that this is based on uh, joint work with uh, Andrew Horning, who's a grad student at uh, Cornell and his supervisor, Alex Townsend, who I'm sure many of you uh, know as well, who's also at Cornell. Um, okay, so uh, we're, we're, we're all very used to the idea of diagonalizing a finite self adjoint matrix. So in this notation here, matrix A, there exists an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors so that I can write out uh, A in this diagonal form here, where these are the eigenvectors VK. And these VK also act as orthogonal projections onto eigenspace. So in the infinite dimensional version that I'm going to consider, I now have an operator L, which goes uh, from some domain uh, to the Hilbert space that I'm working in. And this uh, domain could be a uh, strict subspace, for example, if I'm dealing with a, uh, with a uh, differential operator. And instead of uh, eigenvalues, uh, the natural thing to look at is something called the spectrum, which is all Z such that L minus Z is not uh, bounded and vertical. So the bad news is that when you consider uh, such operators, typically there no longer exists an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. So what you have to look at instead is something called a projection value spectral measure, which I've denoted by this uh, E here, which you can think of as uh, a generalization of diagonalization in the following sense. So for each borrow measurable set of the real line in this case, your uh, projection by spectral measure associates an orthogonal projection. So you can write out L as an integral over the real line in terms of this um, projection by spectral measure, which looks a bit like diagonalization. So the analogy is with this uh, formula up here. Uh, so this diagonalizes the operator, and the goal is to compute uh, the spectral measure or a scalar version of it, as I'm going to describe next. So in applications, what you actually typically do is you take inner products of this uh, measure with uh, a given uh, vector f, and then you can decompose this um, measure into a discrete part, which is just a series of uh, the racks at each eigenvalue, plus a continuous part. So don't don't worry so much if, if this is all sort of a bit too uh, a bit too much functional analysis. The main thing to note is that um, many operators in practice the spectral measure no longer just cons consists of uh, eigenvalues and Dirac measures, but you also get a continuous uh, component here, which I've shown in red, which is the, um, the density function of the, of the measure. And there's, there's often, well, sometimes there's a horrible other part as well, which I won't uh, discuss, but in applications, typically that doesn't pop up. Okay, so computing, uh, computing this measure is, is crucial in a whole load of applications. I've got a very small list of of them here. Uh, probably the most famous one is quantum mechanics. For example, if you uh, solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation, so this equation here, uh, then you can represent the solution as an integral over the projection value spectral measure uh, with, with the exponent. Okay, so this is just the, uh, the functional character. So this is perhaps the generalization of what you might do uh, with a finite matrix. You might diagonalize it and then look at the, uh, how, how the function operates on the uh, on the eigenvalue. Okay, so that, that's what that's the thing we're interested in computing. Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, so I've got here a, a quote from Arvidsson, who was a, an operator theorist at Berkeley, basically saying that um, most of the operators that we're given in the real world aren't presented in a diagonalized form. In fact, the diagonalization might not exist. Uh, and this raises the question of how to implement the methods of finite dimensional numerical linear algebra in order to deal with uh, spectra of infinite dimensional operators. And then he goes on to say that there's a dearth of literature on this problem and no proven techniques. So this is quite a pessimistic 
optimistic uh, viewpoint because, of course, uh, there's, there's been a whole load of stuff on computing, um, computing spectrum and infinite dimensions. But I think what Arvison is getting at here is that there's no real uh, general method that is able to compute a diagonalization of an infinite dimensional operator. So in the context of spectral measures, there are uh, specific cases that you can already do, for instance, um, compact perturbations of tridiagonal tri topics operators and some classes of stern liberal problems. But in general, there's no sort of general method that can that can deal with these operators. Okay, so the goal of this talk is to um, develop such a method that uh, computes the spectral measure of the operator itself rather than an underlying discretization of truncation. And so you can think of this as trying to use the tools of finite dimensional numerical linear algebra in order to uh, deal with uh, an infinite dimensional problem. Okay. So uh, I'm going to kick off with an idea from physics, which might look familiar in terms of um, the Cauchy transform. So what I'm going to look at is uh, something called resolvent, which is just shifted linear systems of my operator A. And I'm going to pick a point X on the real axis and shift it by a small amount into the complex plane. And if I do this and subtract its conjugate and take in the products, uh, what I end up with is a convolution of the measure, the thing I'm trying to compute, with the Poisson kernel. This is a smooth version of the measure, and that in fact converges weakly to the measure as my smoothing parameter epsilon goes to zero. So in other words, if I take a continuous function, I found a continuous function and integrate against it, uh, I gain convergence. So you can think of this as uh, approximating the, the thing I'm interested in with a uh, smooth function. And then I'm going to approximate this left-hand side here uh, via truncation parameter n to compute the um, shifted uh, inverses here. So let's look at a, uh, a quick example just, just to see what might go wrong. So I'm going to take a, a model of graphene. So this is a hexagonal tiling. Uh, infinite tiling. I'm going to pass a magnetic field perpendicular through the tiling, and then this is a snapshot of the infinite matrix that I get. So this is just a small truncation. So you get you get a nice uh, sparsely structure for the bandwidth range. So remember, I'm taking a truncation parameter n to approximate my smooth measure with smoothing parameter epsilon. So let's see what happens if I fix epsilon to say 0 0.1 and I increase n. So here I'm plotting the density function of uh, this. It's, it's in fact a probability measure. Okay, so it converges to something, but if you show this to a physicist, uh, they, they don't like it because the, well, they, they know that the um, density has to hit zero at this symmetrical point here. This has some interesting physics. So in other words, we're, we're too over smooth. So let's try the opposite thing. Let's Take n quite large to be a thousand, and let's uh, decrease the smoothing parameter. So we're okay for a bit, uh, but eventually we become unstable. Uh, although not not really unstable, what we're actually doing is picking up the spectral measure associated with the, the discretization. So in this case, this is just uh, well, it'll be one thousand eigenvalues in this interval here, and we're getting. Uh, Dirac, um, Dirac points for each of those eigenvalues. Okay, so we, we want to look at the full infinite dimensional operator. So it turns out that if you know the uh, off diagonal decay of the matrix, so I won't go into much detail about this, um, then you can compute the spectral measure by choosing the truncation parameter n adaptively dependent on epsilon. Okay, so in this case, uh, the result just says that if you if you have a sparse infinite matrix and you know the sparsity structure, then you can compute the measure. So this is what happens if you use this adaptive procedure, and you get this nice uh, sharp plot here, and it's hitting zero at the symmetrical point. This is called the Dirac point, uh, and that's that's good. If you show this to physicists, they're they're happy. Okay, so so far so good. So we we've been, we've figured out how we might be able to apply. Um, this, this is called uh, Stone's formula, how we might apply this relation here to compute the measure. But is that all of the story? So I'm going to move on to another example, which shows that uh, in practice, the Poisson kernel isn't the best kernel to use. 
So I'm going to take a, an operator, which is just uh, multiplication by x on the integral minus 1, 1 plus uh, an integral term here, which just acts as a compact uh, perturbation. And I'm going to describe this using an adaptive Chebyshev collocation method. I'm not going to go into the details of how, how this works. It's just working uh, under the hood. And I'm going to look at the spectral measure with vector f. Remember, my Hilbert space is a vector space of functions. So my vector corresponds to a function. So this is the function I've chosen. And this is what happens when you plot the smooth uh, measures. So you get this nice uh, continuous component across the interval minus 1, 1, uh, which corresponds to a perturbation of the multiplication factor. And then you also get an eigenvalue, which appears uh, due to this compact perturbation at around 1.37, I think it's the value. But the point is that you can, you can roughly see the shape uh, taking place. So this, this is looking good. You're seeing convergence here and convergence to the Dirac spike. But let's look a bit, a bit closer at this. So remember, I have a truncation parameter n, which in this case just controls the size of the matrix that I'm using. Uh, and if I plot the convergence of this uh, approximation against the smooth measure, this shows the, the accuracy that I can get for different epsilon. So you see that as epsilon, the smoothing parameter gets smaller, I need a larger value of n. And you can think of that as because I'm evaluating the resolvent closer to the spectrum of the operator. So the operator is, the shifted operator is becoming more singular. So roughly you need about 20 over epsilon, um, n to be 20 over epsilon to get uh, machine precision here. So now if we look at how uh, the smooth approximations converge to the density function as epsilon goes to zero, we get a very, uh, very bad plot in that um, the, the error is only order epsilon modulo a log term. So in other words, I only get this, this very slow order one convergence. So if I combine these plots, what it tells me is that with the Poisson kernel and for this nice example, right, this is a very simple operator, this multiplication and then uh, a compact perturbation, uh, it's infeasible to get about more than about five or six digits of accuracy in computing this. Uh, density function. Okay, so can we do better? So remember, we, um, we previously we computed the convolution with the Poisson kernel, and that was nice because we could compute that convolution via uh, the resolvent, right? This shifted linear systems, and that was because the kernel was a rational function. Uh, so what I'm going to do is look at more general kernels. So I'm going to say that a kernel is an nth order kernel if it's uh, integrable. It integrates to one and it has a certain number of vanishing uh, moments. So this sort of uh, definition appears uh, a lot in signal processing, for example, or statistics. And I'm also going to assume that there's uh, a certain amount of decay just for the, for the arguments to, to go through. Okay, so if I have a, an nth order kernel that satisfies these properties and I rescale it with the smoothing parameter of silent, and then if I look at the different between uh, the convolution of the measure that I'm trying to compute with that kernel and the density function, then I can get improved rates of convergence. Remember in the previous plot, we had this slow convergence for, for the Poisson kernel, but uh, if my measure is regular enough, it's, so for example, if it's uh, holder continuous, I get uh, order M convergence if it's uh, sufficiently regular. And also I can do the same thing with um, Sobler spaces and local LP convergence. Okay. So the question then is, can I design a, an nth order kernel, uh, which I can also um, compute with? And it turns out that you can. So if I look at uh, kernels of this form here, rational functions, then, uh, so, so AJ, sorry, here are poles in the upper half plane, uh, BJ are poles in the lower half plane. Then I can compute the convolution uh, of this kernel with the spectral measure just via this formula here, which involves shifted linear solves, again, this resolvent operator, and inner products, right? So I'm evaluating the resolvents in the complex plane. And it turns out that if you fix m poles in the upper half plane and m poles in the lower half plane, then there's a unique alpha and alpha j and beta j, uh, which satisfy the conditions for an f kernel. 
So at the moment, we recommend using uh, equally spaced poles uh, at equal distance from the real axis. Okay, so let's uh, let's revisit the integral operator. So this these are the kernels that I'm using. Okay, so uh, m equals one is just the Poisson kernel, and then you have these higher order kernels uh, which look progressively uh, peak. And uh, this is what happens if you uh, plot the uh, the error um, between the uh, the smooth uh, the smooth um, measures and the uh, the density function of the measure. So you see order one convergence, order two, order three, and so on. So now you can get uh, you can easily extend this down to machine precision for smaller epsilon. Uh, so that's kind of the, the final example that I'm going to present for this algorithm. So you, you can, if you're interested in examples and in, including partial differential operators and uh, integral and lattice operators, then you can see the uh, the paper as well. Um, so I'm now going to finish with what I think is quite quite a nice fun example of computing eigenvalues uh, via computing spectral uh, measures, which you might think is a bit bit odd, uh, but bear with me. So I'm going to look at something called a Dirac operator. So you can think of this as the square root of a Schrodinger operator, and it describes the motion of a relativistic electron. And if, for this particular example, um, the essential spectrum, so that's the bit that's uh, preserved under compact perturbation, is the whole of the real line except the interval minus one to one. And this means that if you apply standard Galerkin methods, right, so you look, for instance, at an orthonormal basis and you truncate your resulting matrix, you get something called spectral pollution. So these are false eigenvalues. So as your discretization size increases, you get clusterings to eigenvalues that you think are eigenvalues, but have nothing to do with the actual eigenvalues or bound states of the Dirac operator. So written out, the Dirac operator looks like this. It's a coupled system on the half line. Now remember, all I need to do to be able to apply this algorithm, so if I go back to these slides, is be able to compute shifted linear systems, solutions of shifted linear systems, and also take in a product. So I'm going to map the uh, the half line to um, the interval minus one one and solve this using a sparse spectral method. Again, don't worry about, about the details of that. And this is what happens. So you can rescale the measure so that you get uh, spikes corresponding to eigenvalues or the point spectrum of the operator. And if you resolve the spectral measure uh, by resolving these peaks, you can compute the location of the eigenvalues. So this dashed line here corresponds to one, the 1,000th uh, eigenvalue. So if you do this uh, and you look at the convergence as your smoothing parameter goes to zero, you see that you get a nice convergence uh, to essentially machine precision for the first 1,000 eigenvalues. And this, this, is a, this is a really nice result because for this particular type of operator, um, typical method only uh, can gain a, a, a few digits for the first few excited states because of the spectral pollution and because also you have clustering of the eigenvalues uh, at once. So I've plotted against, this is the eigenvalue parameter, one might say. Okay. So uh, just to wrap up, this algorithm also um, formed part of a, a, a bigger picture sort of program on the foundations of infinite dimensional spectral computation. And the key question is, you know, what is possible in infinite dimensional numerical linear algebra in, in spectral computation? So to do this, uh, we deal with operators directly instead of truncating them solved. Uh, and by doing this, we can uh, compute many spectral properties for the first time. And you can also classify these problems into a hierarchy, which measures their intrinsic difficulty and allows you to prove that the algorithms uh, we're developing are optimal. So here's, here's a list of some of the other spectral uh, problems, computational spectral problems that uh, have been classified in this framework. Uh, I won't go through these because uh, I don't have enough time, but uh, I'll leave some references at the end for papers which deal with these other operations, uh, these other problems as well. So to conclude, uh, we now have a general framework for diagonalization of uh, self adjoint operators. The key ingredient is convolution with rational kernels, and you can uh, evaluate this conv conv that convolution using the resolvent. All you need to be able to do to do this is solve the linear systems and compute in the products. High order kernels lead to high order convergence. Uh, it's also completely parallelizable, so I didn't mention this, but yeah, you can you can split up. Um, 
and, and run these solves in parallel. And it forms part of a, a bigger program uh, in infinite dimensional numerical linear algebra. If you want the code, you can visit uh, our GitHub page here, and uh, this code was written with uh, Andrew Horney. Uh, here are the references, and um, that's it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, all right, thank you, Matthew, for the great talk. Um, and uh, Davide, do we have any questions on Zoom? Uh, yeah, so we have two questions from by Marcus Webb. The first one, uh, so he asked, you mentioned an idea from physics for the Poisson kernel smoothed spectrum measure, but which part of physics? Okay, so uh, that was this slide here. So um, when when people do density of states calculations for interesting condensed matter physics, often they're left with a a large sparse a finite matrix, and they use um, ideas like this, um, smoothing with, they call it the Lorenz, Lorenz kernel, it's the same thing as the Poisson kernel, um, to, to deal with that. There's, there's various uh, numerical linear algebra routines. Also, this formula here in the infinite dimensional setting is also known as Stone's formula. Uh, so, this, this is quite a classical way of uh, even, even defining the spectral measure uh, in mathematical physics. Okay, the second question he has is, um, what effect does the location of the poles which you choose have on the nth order kernel approach? Ah, okay, yeah. I had a feeling this question would, would pop up. Um, the truth is, at the moment, we don't understand this fully. So we, we've, we've tested a few cases. So for, for, first of all, if, if, you, if you want to compute these alpha and these betas to get an nth order kernel, what you end up with is a, a, is a, a linear system uh, a random on linear system, and the, uh, the sort of the best choice of, of poles by, if you just look at that system, will be rotated roots of unity. But typically, you only look at m equals say 10. So that means you're not you're not too bothered about conditioning of that linear system because you only have to solve it once. And because of that, uh, we we actually found that the, this choice here of equally spaced along a a line of a constant imaginary part uh, behaves slightly better than that choice. Um, we, we also tried other things like Chebyshev um, clustering of, of the nodes uh, and various things. Um, so, so at the moment, we, we can only say empirically this is the best choice so far, which kind of makes sense, right? You you, you want all your poles to be an, an equal distance from the real line in some sense, so that they're just as difficult to solve as each other in terms of solving the linear system, uh, but we don't know. Um, a, a, another choice could be if you look at dyadic spacing uh, that, that are getting clustered towards the real axis, then if the epsilon is too large you, uh, and you halve epsilon, you only have to do one more resolving. So, uh, yeah. That's kind of okay, weird. thank you. So the last question on Zoom is by Nick Therfatten, and he asks, is there a rational approximation problem underlying your selection of kernel? Uh, that, that's a very good question. So, uh, since it works, so, so the, 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 the poles, in, in order for this, this, this sort of algorithm and, and this, uh, this result to go through, the poles are entirely up to your, uh, up to your choice. But it could be beneficial, for instance, if you're looking at um, square root type singularities, which often occur in the spectral measure of Schrödinger operators. It might be beneficial to look at how you know how you approximate square roots and things like that. Uh, th this is actually something we're looking at uh, for. If I go back to near the start, for solving evolution equations. So here you can write out the solution of an evolution equation in terms of the spectral measure. This is this is just functional calculus. Um, and by deforming into the complex plane, uh, the other viewpoint is that essentially what we're doing is, is, is a contour map. Um, so, yes, that, that, that's a question we're currently trying to answer for fractional uh, diffusion, right? Where L is a, um, say, it's a heat, a heat operator and um, we're looking at the square root. So, the, the answer is there probably is in certain contexts, uh, but we haven't really made that connection precise yet. Okay, thank you. 
And uh, Hussam, uh, quickly, are there any questions on YouTube? There are no questions on YouTube. All right. Um...